Today is Thursday, August 30th, 2007. I'm H.F. Williamson. I'm interviewing Ralph Langenheim for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center. We are at Studio X, Campbell Hall, Urbana, Illinois. Henry Radcliffe is the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. Ralph, why don't you start with your background and how you became a naval officer? Well, I grew up in Oklahoma, which was a privilege. It's a special state. My father was Dean of Engineering at the University of Tulsa. I went to school in that place because I didn't realize how smart I was when I was in high school. I was in a very large high school in this, this select group, and I thought I was just average, so I didn't apply for any scholarships until it was too late to get any. But anyway, uh, I went through and I took geology rather than engineering, which set up a parental conflict. And what year was this? Well, I went to school, went to college in 1939, and I'm in the class of 43 at the University of Tulsa. So anyway, uh, about that time, the draft started up, and I, my parents, being proactive, were pushing me to get into the naval program, V7, and I did. I applied for it. I really wanted to follow in my father's footsteps. He'd been in the Army, Army Engineers in France, but they thought that I'd be safer in the Navy. Little did they know the nature of the war that, we, that was coming up. But in any event, I did go down and applied for, the, for, for that. And when I took the physical, I was so nervous that I had an extremely high blood pressure and had to come back the next day to take it again. I mean, I was like that. I can imagine. But anyway, I joined it, and I was in the V-7 program. The V-7 program was an officer procurement program that allowed people who were in college to stay in the college where they were, taking the courses that they were then taking, graduating in anything from modern dance to nuclear engineering, which didn't exist at that time, at least not in college curriculum. And then they went to midshipman school, and you got a month of boot camp, and then you got three months of of officer training, and then they commissioned you. Uh, you were classified. You were either aimed for deck or engineering. If you had an engineering degree of any kind, and geological engineering was my degree, that condemned me to the engineering program. But I went. I was very fortunate. They, they had schools in many places. Columbia University, uh, up at uh, Northwestern, was it? Yeah, Northwestern, here, there, and elsewhere. But they had a small engineering group that they had at, at, at Annapolis, and I got selected into that. So I went to Annapolis, the summer school for farmers, and was there, there for, there for the, the midshipman school, uh, three months, four months, I guess it was. And that was a real, real experience, absorbed that we did, lived like midshipmen. We were midshipmen. We were in, in, the, in Bancroft Hall and all of that. When they had a formal parade for the president of Paraguay, they hit us off in a dark corner because they didn't think we were good enough, but that was all right. But in that time, I absorbed a, affection and a feeling for the Navy that has stuck with me for the rest of my life. I, I served, served until they threw me out as a reservist. So that was, that was really a, a good experience. Now, it, I didn't get submerged in the, in the uh, naval tradition. I would have been a troublemaker if I had been a permanent mm -hmm. officer. But, uh, for example, I did, did make, take the time to go down and visit the campus of St. John's College, which was a, a liberal arts refuge. I don't know whether people remember it now or not, but... Uh, that was partially in revolt against being forced into the engineering curriculum instead of the straight geology curriculum when I was an undergraduate. So when it came time to uh, select what kind of service you wanted, along with people who didn't have the nerve to go in submarines or the, or the foolhardiness to go into naval air, uh, surface officers generally opted for destroyers, which had a reputation of being smaller ships where a young man could could flower. But uh, having been, being afflicted with a lack of appreciation of my abilities, as they've been demonstrated since then, 
I decided, well, I, I probably wouldn't get some uh, destroyers, so I'll apply for subchaser school. Hmm. So I got sent to subchaser school in Miami, Florida. And while I was at uh, subchaser school, I had my first and only case of, of seasickness. They had a bunch of student officers out on a 110-foot wooden boat, and, and these guys started going to the, going to the rail to upchuck, and there were a bunch of regular crew members in the back end of there laughing their heads off at them. So when mine came up, I swallowed it, and I never had seasick again, <laughs> which was a pretty good deal. Also at Subchaser School, one of the one of the one of the real events of my life, I, I had my first drink. <laughs> mm. An old chief fed me one of a, a highly colored, highly sugared cocktail, which I'm sure was designed for for ladies. But anyway, that was the beginning of that. And I'd also been raised rather strictly. I I, I really never had a cu cup of coffee until I got into the Navy. So that was part of the generation moving away from the the strictures of your, your life as a child. Which brings up the subject, they talk about how the people that were in the service were matured in the service. Well, you know what? They all started out somewhere between 18 and 20 or 21 years old. And whether they were in the service or not, they were gonna mature during those, those years. So it just provided a different environment for being mature. We, we get credit for something that we didn't really earn. But anyway, when Subchaser school, all during the subchaser school, the, the, the threat was if you make a mess of things, we'll send you to the amphibians. The amphibious forces were growing like mad at the time. They didn't point out that, that they had just managed to, to quell the German submarines pretty much. The emergency was over. They weren't expanding surface vessels. They weren't commissioning more subchasers or patrol craft to, or DEs to go after submarines. They were putting everybody they could grab into the amphibians. So when we graduated, we all got sent to the amphibious training base up at Solomons, Maryland. And I think that's the only time I ever wept as an adult. It was just humiliating. But I went on up there, and it was humiliating because the amphibians were the stepchildren of the Navy. The only part of the Navy that appreciated the amphibious forces were the, were the Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps, as we all know, is... Uh, the option that's selected by a lot of midshipmen who don't think they'll ever make admiral. But <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a different culture. We get along well with the Marines. Okay, so I got assigned to Annapolis. Or excuse me, the, uh, the uh, Solomon's okay. tra training base at Solomon's. Solomon's, Maryland was a small fishing village not much of a summer stuff at all, on the Chop Tank River in Chesapeake Bay. And they plopped this base down there to train people for the amphibious forces, LCIs, mostly landing craft, infantry, large. So you showed up there, rode the train from Oklahoma to Washington, and the bus from Washington to Solomon's arrived after dark, Lighting was bad, the place was muddy, they had wooden sidewalks. Trudged in there, was assigned to a, a room in the BOQ, which was a barracks room with minimal facilities, a naked light bulb and all that kind of stuff. Bathroom down the hall, it's typical, typical service stuff. Uh, drifted down to the so-called officers club, which was a poorly lit bar with not very many people in it, with a very garish mural of LCI's landing on uh, the beaches in Sicily. And there were a couple of a few guys there huddled over their drinks that didn't have much use for those greenhorns. They'd gone through all of this. And they, <laughs> it was very, very dreary, a very unfortunate situation. It was the low point in my naval career, certainly being the transition from Subchaser School to Solomon's. But things picked up. We signed to a, a nucleus crew for a ship that had not yet been built. The lead petty, leading petty officers, pharmacist mate, bosun, gunner, and so on, and the captain who was uh, one Fred Caridio, who was a Notre Dame football player. He's a uh, cousin of Frank, the famous All-American. Anyway, he'd been a first string Notre Dame football player and he was that for the rest of his life. He was that while he was captain of our ship. But everybody, he was a charismatic, charismatic character, and we, we sort of rallied around. We went through the training, went up and down Chesapeake Bay, 
standing watches, beaching the ship, and this, that, and the other thing, and learning the trade. And finally, uh, they had a ship ready for us, and they sent us up to uh, a pier in New York City, in the harbor, and our ship was being constructed out at Perth Amboy in what had been an asphalt plant. Mass production, they brought in steel boxes and welded them together, and presto, you had a ship. And as engineer, I was sent down to the yard to see what was going on, and I, I saw and was amazed. Uh, these ships, uh, this would probably be a good time to describe the ships. These ships were uh, 132 feet long, 32 feet wide, had a double bottom, carried enough fuel to cross the Atlantic Ocean twice, and enough water to carry their crew over once. Not enough water to uh, carry troops for any long distance. They carried 200 troops. Hmm. They had a crew of 21 men and four officers. Uh, they had ramps on either side of the bow. Those of you that are going to see this thing on email or whatever, uh, we'll see a picture of those ships. And if you remember the ships uh, that are on the beach and have a couple of gangways coming down either side of the bow, those are LCIs. And a round con, ours did, the older ones were square, and the, y the younger ones had doors on them. Uh, they could travel at 12 knots flat out. They had a weird and wonderful motive system, eight bus engines, mounted to feed into one screw. The, the business ends of them were together, they called them quad mounts, and fed to the screw but through a, that gearbox. And it was a variable pitch propeller also, so when we wanted to change speed or back down, we just changed the pitch on the propeller. They were could turn on a dime. They were great apparatus. They were very reliable, but they were not proof against 18-year-old motor machinist mates who'd been following a plow ten year, five, two years before and so on and <laughs> so forth, and who were in their hot rod stage. So they, they had a lot of trouble with them. Our ship did not have trouble with its, with its engines. A lot, the, the things had got a bad reputation, but it wasn't, it wasn't really the, sh the engines that were bad. It was the, the people. So anyway, we trained on that thing, and we went up to New, New York, and I went out. To, and they also put me in charge of, of buying all the stuff that was to outfit us for the first time. They gave me a Navy Standard Stock Catalog and an allowance list. I didn't do the ammunition, but I did all the rest of it, and I didn't do the navigation equipment. So I ordered all the things that were on the list, and then I went down through the list and ordered everything else that I thought we'd like. So we had a set of ship silver. <laughs> Some of our colleagues did not. Uh, we had a lot of little supplies like cotter keys. But being young and stupid, I didn't realize that the unit M for cotter keys meant thousands. Oh. So <laughs> we had enough cotter keys to outfit the entire flotilla and also to use for poker chips. But we had them. And I bought a tap and die set. And it turned out pretty good because our anchor winch engine was an oil field engine, a gasoline engine, and a, and a winch uh, sitting out on an open deck a foot and a half out of the water. And by the time we got to England, you released the brake and the anchor didn't drop because everything was rusted tight. So we immediately drilled those bearings and put in zerk fittings and fixed our stuff and then we loaned the equipment to everybody else and they did the same. So that was a minor triumph from the point of view of a, a green officer. Well, we came back down to, to uh, Chesapeake Bay and went through shakedown and there were memorable occasions like the training ship that took us up into Cambridge, Maryland one night just before Christmas going up that dark, dark estuary with no lights on, no lights on shore, just little blinking navigational lights and very calm, sort of an eerie feeling. So we landed in, in Cambridge, which had shut up for the night. It was probably two o'clock in the morning. There was nobody there, and we just walked around on those brick streets and then went back and got on board. Hmm. And then one time uh, I had the watch going down Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> the Baltimore night boat was coming up from from Norfolk, big multi-decked steamer with lights all over it. <laughs> and 
I got confused and turned left when I should have turned right, which was on a collision course. <laughs> Lots of ringing bells and tooting whistles and so on. But anyway, we missed, missed them and they missed us. And nobody ever heard about it. I guess it went into the log. But another time we were training down at Little Creek, Virginia. And one of our fellow sister ships got stuck on the beach, broached. And <laughs> this was in the winter. So we came in, let go our stern anchor, which pulls you off the beach, and then edged up to the other ship, fired a line over, put our bow anchor cable on their stern winch, and drew it taut and pulled them out a little bit so they didn't get washed clear up on the beach. And then we spent the night there. <laughs> <laughs> with somebody on watch every four hours. I got one of those watches and stood out in the sleep, cold to the bone, watching that cable. That's a, a memory. And there are other memories. I, I could bore you with them. But finally, uh, we were assigned to a, attached to a convoy going from the Capes, Virginia Capes to Gibraltar. More than a hundred ships. And they put LCIs on either side and we set out, and immediately it blew up to very high winds. The, the waves were far higher in our ship when we were down in the trough. We couldn't see anybody, and when we were up on top, we could see them all. So promptly, most of our crew got seasick, so we were on sandwiches you made yourself. <laughs> on watch, you stood in that open bucket just 30 feet off the water. Fairly dry, because we just bobbed up. We went up one side of the waves and down the other. We didn't ram into them and throw the spray up and we didn't have green water on the deck or any of those things but we had no lights the only light on those ships was a stern light a blue stern light and you had to keep station on that well if you think about what what happens to you when you try to try to follow a car at a fixed distance on the highway you creep up and you cut your speed and you drop back and so that's what was going on all the time and while that was going on, you were going up over these things and down like that, so the guy was out of sight. And when you went up those things, since the wind was at the rear, you got up at the top, the wind caught you, you went, came down like that, so it was a <laughs> that type of a movement. Corkscrew. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, you stood those nights, four on and eight off, and all four officers took bridge washers. I was an engineering duty only officer, but I took bridge wash. Had to. <laughs> I, one thing I remember, in, one time in a, in a, when it was raining badly, and I was following that dim blue light ahead, doing my best to follow it. I pulled my jacket up over my head, and I was looking through a buttonhole with one eye, <laughs> which doesn't give you very good depth perception. It's interesting. You, you learn a lot there. So it was a great voyage, and as I say, I, I never was seasick, so I was happy. How long did it take? It took us, well, we went, we split off of that convoy and went up to the Azores, to Horta. I don't remember exactly how many days I could get it out of my book, but uh, it wasn't our longest. It was, it was more than two weeks, though. And it was stormy all the way. Uh, we had a fourth officer, Thomas O'Brien from Boston, a young guy, he was added to the crew while we were in New York. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but he had an active case of tuberculosis. And uh, the pharmacist mate, who was a 32-year-old lawyer, who had been turn, turned down for officer school because he had an overbite, he was, in essence, one of the four people on board who were over 25. <laughs> so he was one of, one of the adults. He quickly caught on to the fact that O'Brien was in trouble, and O'Brien would fall asleep on watch yeah. at night. So Marzalek was standing watch with him. So a good portion of the time when we were on night watches up there, we had a pharmacist, pharmacist mate first class conning the ship instead of an officer. Great. <laughs> the LCI Navy was like that. That would never even happen on a destroyer, mind you. So uh, eventually we got to Horta. One little memory there, two more memories there. We started coming into the harbor, and we had a pilot, a Portuguese pilot. And LCIs drew five feet in rear and three and a half feet forward, and they had a high focal. 
So the wind would catch that, and if you're steering into the wind, you couldn't couldn't do that. <laughs> this guy got caught up in that, and he wasn't. He was accustomed to the ships that had keels and behaved like ships. Ours behaved differently. And when we got in a really bad situation, we'd turn around and back into the wind and control it better in reverse. But anyway, he couldn't control this thing, and he was headed for the headed for the breakwater. And he would say, he said, back, back all engine. And then he said, back full. And then he screamed, back more full. <laughs> and at that point, the captain took over and we got in. And the other little little incident that was fun on, on, on Horta, we, we got a, about two hours to walk around. And I met this gorgeously uniformed, portly gentleman, gray hair, lots of gold braid and stripes and this, that, and the other thing, you know. I was sure it was a probably an admiral, so I saluted him. It turned out he was a sergeant, Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those highly decorated ar armies. But anyway, we left Horta. We took over, went across the Bay of Biscay under the escort of a hunt-class destroyer, British Navy. Still stormy, but not as bad. Didn't see a thing. Uh, came into Falmouth and came in and anchored, watered the ship, and this and did a few housekeeping things. I remember the first time I went ashore, we found out about a high tide. The tide was 18 feet, something like that. So here was this dock way up here, and here we were, climbed up the ladder, and here was an old gent fishing. First UK person I saw, and I thought I'd be friendly. I said, well, it sure is good to finally be in England. And he turned around to me, and he said, Young man, I can't mimic the accent. He said, young man, you're not in England. You're in the Grand Duchy of Cornwall. <laughs> <laughs> that was the attitude there. <laughs> Funny as heck. Anyway, eventually we joined a convoy going up the channel. We were headed for Dartmouth. We no sooner got out of the, We were steaming out of the harbor, and everybody was lollygagging around looking at the scenery. And I sort of thought, well, look, the Germans are on the other side of the channel. Maybe we should have manned a gun, you know. Captain didn't say anything, captain didn't say anything, so I remember it because I was the guy that suggested it. We manned a gun. But also, we hit fog. And you can't see in fog. And they ships have fog horns, and they slow down, and they toot their horns. Well, we were tooting ours. We were all little LCIs, 155 footers, creeping along. Suddenly, we got to be, beep, beep, <laughs> big convoy. The next thing, we looked up, and here was a steel cliff next to us, and there were guys peeking over the side of it. We were, we'd run into another convoy of merchant ships. These guys leaned over the edge. <laughs> we couldn't see the ship ahead. We couldn't see the ship. We were following a fog buoy. You trail a spar with a scoop on it, and it throws up water. And when you can't see the ship, you can see that. So here's the, sh the ship ahead of you, and here's the spar, and we're following that splash. Well, shortly thereafter, the splash disappeared. We learned later that one of those big ships had gone between us and that ship, and we hadn't seen it. What? Anyway, clear, clear water came, and here we were, alone in the English Channel. <laughs> off to the left is the, ch the shore, and off to the right is the German shore, the French shore. So we're tootling along, not really knowing where we were, although I pr pretty quickly figured, being a geologist, I could read maps. And these coastal charts that the British gave us were topographic maps and so on. So I figured out where we were. I knew where we were. The captain didn't know where we were, and he wouldn't believe me when I told him where we were. So we, we finally pulled over and hailed a fishing boat and asked for directions. Total embarrassment. <laughs> we're full of that kind of stuff, but th that the convoy disintegrated. That's the first disintegrating convoy that we were in. A lot of but many of my best stories are about convoys that disintegrated. Well, anyway, we got to Dartmouth and we went in. We steamed up, waterfall. The f French PT crews on the on the left hand side were hurling obscenities at us. We were not f popular with the free French. We passed a what I thought was a buoy in the middle of the harbor, and went far up and anchored a whole string of us alongside the shore in what was a great big lake-like thing. Next morning, we were in a narrow little channel, 
and that great big lake-like thing was a mud flat. The oh. tide had gone out. This was new. Some of our ships were sitting there out of the water. <laughs> Didn't hurt them. We had flat bottoms and were built to go on the beach. So when the tide came in, they floated off. And when we came out of that place for the first time, went down through the harbor, that, that buoy that we'd passed so closely to was a beacon sitting on a very jagged rock. <laughs> oh. Innocence abroad. Our flagship being having some clout, it had a, a full commander on board, by the way, had tied up to the dock. And that crew had never dealt with tides like that, and they were awakened in the middle of the night when all their lines broke. The water had gone out from under them, and they were hanging their, <laughs> their mooring lines. Great stuff. Am I giving you too much here? I go. You don't care, huh? I'll all right. Well, I'll what, while we're interrupting, what armament did the... Uh, the LCILs had five... 20 millimeter guns. These are Ehrlichan guns, uh, Swiss manufacture, and they they fired like machine guns with tracers. That was our anti-aircraft, and that was also our our armament when we went on the beach. I don't know how effective they were, but I can vouch for the fact that in the entire time that we were on our ship, we had periodically we had anti-aircraft training where we got to fire a towed drone, we never hit the drone. Now, we also never used the guns. We only had one opportunity to use the guns. We were at anchor off the beach in Normandy on D-Day, and we'd been sternly instructed not to fire on any fire unless we were fired upon attack. So we were all in the sack. We had an anchor watch up there. This is jumping ahead. All of a sudden, whammo, somebody hit the bottom of the ship with a sledgehammer. Well, I sort of woke up, and nobody seemed to be stirring, and nobody came down from the bridge to tell us about it. So I decided to find out what happened. I went up, and I asked the, the uh, seaman that was up there. I said, what happened? He said, well, he said, a plane came over this way and went across us, and it dropped a bomb between us and the, and the destroyer over there. I said, well, if that happens again, would you sound general quarters, please? <laughs> So he did. It did happen again. And I came up, and there were little LCVPs, these small little, take, take about 50, 25 men at a time, you know, Higgins boats. There were a string of those tied up to our stern because the anchors wouldn't reach the bottom, and their crews were in there. They were sitting back there with their blazing away with their 50 caliber guns. Captain comes up, looks around. He says, we're, <laughs> he didn't give the order to fire. He said, muster in the mess deck because we weren't supposed to fire and that bomb hadn't been aimed at us. And of course that was the last bomb too. That's all we ever saw of the German Air Force during the entire Normandy landing. Crew was indignant. <laughs> the next time he had a general quarters, he got a report at the bridge which made him indignant. Mess table number one, manned and ready, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but that was our entire, that's the only, we never fired a gun in Agra. We went through the Normandy landing and the landings in the south of France and never fired a gun in anger. We didn't have an opportunity in the South of France, and we had very little opportunity normally. That was it. But anyway, to get back to Dartmouth and things that were happening there, we were in the, the uh, slapped in sands exercise where those three LSTs got sunk by e-boats. That was a very interesting thing. Uh, we went out and we steamed around in circles all night long with with a headquarters company with a West Point colonel on board. And then we went in. We heard nothing of the, of the, of the business. We weren't that far offshore, so we, we heard nothing, and nothing was reported about that. That was going on while we were out there. And then it came time for us to take our troops in and land them. And we started for the shore. And we had sound-powered telephones. There, a little bit better than a tin can and a string. They're a device like that. The, the, the actual sound waves energize a little uh, battery type device, generator t compressed carbon thing, and, and gives, you, gives you what the guy's saying. So they, they really aren't very loud and they aren't too reliable. Anyway, I was back on the fantail stern of the ship next to the winch, that's where the engineering officer, and I was the guy that gave the order to let go the anchor and all of that kind of stuff and took, took charge down there. And I had a talker, a guy on the phone. The bridge talker 
was a coxswain who was 45 years old and old, old. Uh, he was the oldest man on board. He was a regular Navy guy, and he'd been put in that nucleus crew, I guess, to let teach our our guys how to drink because he was a rampant alcoholic, among others. He kept bouncing from seaman first to coxswain and back. But at any rate, he was on that sound-powered phone up on the bridge, and we were approaching the beach, and we hadn't let go our anchor yet, and there were ships on either side of us and all of that. You know, first time, well, it wasn't the first time we'd done things like that in Chesapeake Bay. But, Critia issues the order to the fantail by way of this dead set of ears, and he says, stand by to let go stern anchor, and all that guy heard was let go stern anchor, mm -hmm. so that's what came out of the phone down at our end of it, and I said, let go stern anchor, and over the bo over, overboard it went. It kept, the cable kept going, the cable kept going, the cable kept going, then it got, I decided to look around the seat, I went to the side of the ship and looked ahead and saw that we were still a half mile from the beach at least, far, too far off, and we were down to the last, last, uh, rank of cable on that winch. So I said, all ties her? I said, set the brake on the winch and lie down on the deck. <laughs> Enough experience with oil company people to know that when cables break, they snap back mm -hmm. and cut you in half if, if possible. So we did that and we stopped that ship. There was a tremendous snapping and popping. It didn't pull the winch out of the deck and the cable didn't break and everything else. But it sure made the captain mad. <laughs> So we very, he was trying to impress that West Pointer. So we made a quick turnaround and landed our people. And then uh, on the way back, two crises. One, a seagull decorated the captain's best cap, which he was wearing instead of his usual cap in order to impress that colonel, which didn't improve his disposition any. <laughs> Dry cleaning comes hard in, at sea. <laughs> The next thing that happened is the uh, cook and the motor machinist mates uh, forgot about the fact that they were pumping diesel oil up into the into the tanks that fed the galley. We burned diesel oil to cook our food, and they overflowed on a hot stove, and the stove caught on fire hmm. with our evening meal in it, which was a nice meal to celebrate the removal of those troops. Who, we couldn't feed them, so we didn't eat fancy ourselves. There was a nice roast in there. Well, the cook promptly pulled it, put it out with the cook and, and the bosun's mate promptly put it out with a car, CO2 uh, extinguisher. But the, they set up the gasoline handy billy, which pumps salt water, and it's, it was powered by a single cycle engine, sort of like a, a lawnmower. And your lawnmower engine don't always start. Well, this one wouldn't start. Captain grabbed the hose and which was going to deliver fire foam, and dashes into the into the deck house in the gangway just about the time the hose comes on. So he sprays the gangway from one end to the other with mm -hmm. fire foam, <laughs> and wheels into the kitchen uh, galley and sprays it. Lost lost all that terminology. Sprayed it with fire foam all after the fire was out. So he decreed that the people that that handy billy didn't start. So those guys had to take that apart and clean it put it back together again. So they were engaged in doing that when we got to the harbor. Well, another crisis. We had a outflowing tide and we had to hook a buoy. So the guys got in the in the dinghy and went out out there to, to, to carry the, we were supposed to anchor by the bow, the bow, bow anchor cable and hook it on that, on that buoy. Well, the wind was coming at us. You couldn't, so after several attempts to hook the hook the cable and running over the buoy once and darn near running over the <coughs> the uh, dinghy with the, our people and he turned around and backed into it and we hooked on with the stern anchor. But in the process, my guys were down there in the deck working on that engine with the th wrath of God threatening him, and he ordered the people on the deck to get, get over there and handle the line, not that they were going to be able to do any good. And these guys didn't move. And he started to give them holy hell. And I said, Captain, you ordered those guys to s work on that engine until they got finished. <laughs> and he was at the stage where his reply was, you're confined to quarters. <laughs> 
So I was confined to quarters until an hour or so after we were anchored and were settled down. The captain and Marzalek, the pharmacist mate, and the flotilla doctor who was assigned to our ship, the three of them appeared at my cabin with the ship's whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I was forgiven and restored to duty. <laughs> Things like that happened all the time. How many training exercises were there before? Well, we there were many training exercises at Slapton, but we were that was the only one we were in, and we learned a lot. We uh, we got that guy off the bridge, and and when we were landing in Normandy, we were landing on a rising tide, which meant there was six inches more water there every few minutes, and uh, every minute, I guess it was. 18 feet in four hours, if you figure it out, which lightened the ship. And we were, every trooper that we unloaded was between 180 and 250 pounds with these gear, so we were taking a load off of that ship. And so we kept floating free. And they'd shove it up with the, crank up the engine and shove it up and beach, beach to keep it on the beach. So we did that. And every time we floated free, there was a long, short current. So we floated off like this. So we had to let out a cable back aft. Well, we used up all the cable three times. So we'd, we'd have to rewind the cable, circle around and hit the beach again, rewind the cable. And all the time we had little splashes appearing in fours, artillery. I think it was 88s, but there are different, different opinions on what it was. They were firing blind, they couldn't see us, but they could sure see our barrage balloons. Some people wised up and got rid of the barrage balloons, and we didn't. But anyhow, uh, we never got hit. I'd like so, you to back up and, and uh, talk about preparing for the invasion, and when, when did you load up the troops? And what you know, what, what time of day, or which day was it? Well, we loaded, up, we loaded up the troops in Dartmouth Harbor. Which day was this? Uh, that was on the 4th, and we w took them out and anchored off of Brixham, which was right up the coast, the first harbor up the coast, with a lot of ships. And then we had that day delay because of the storm, which everybody knows about, so we didn't sail out on the f night of the 5th, we sailed out on the night of the 6th, the 5th, 6th night, rather than the 4th, 5th night. And we sailed... Early in the in the dark, and you had how many troops on board approximately? We had two hundred. Right. Two hundred. We did not have the troops that we'd had in the exercise. We had a bunch of of support troops. We came in at we were to beach at five thirty in the afternoon, and uh, the beach was secured very quickly, actually, except for this this which shell beach, fire. Which beach was this? Utah. Okay. Except for the shell fire that was coming in. So we had no trouble with that, but. Well, let's finish the the beaching business. We finally put the first, the last of them off on LCVPs, and then we lost the doctor because the engineering officer on the flagship got got a piece of shrapnel off of one of those shells. And that was, so far as I know, the only person touched on in our whole flotilla. Well, no, we had some some of our flotilla were up on on Omaha, and one of them got sunk, but um, no no real damage to us. So to get back to the, to the voyage over, it, it was in the dark, and again, it was spooky. Mm -hmm. There was a light sea, and you were seeing just the just constant noise of the engines, and full, full general quarters, we were on watch and watch. Well, we weren't on GQ, we were on watch and watch. Half the crew on duty at all times, guns manned, and so on and so forth, and a low murmur coming up from the some of the troops who were loafing around in the in the well deck and so on, but most we, they they couldn't all be on deck at the same time. There wasn't room enough for them. In fact, when we were waiting to sail out of Dartmouth, we began having trouble. The ship would do this, and then it'd do that, and then it'd do this, and then it'd do that. That was because they had a crap game going in the, in the in the in the well deck, and they were moving from one side of the ship to the other. And the guys in the crap game were enough to make the ship. Captain got exercised about it, my job to keep it on an even keel, but you couldn't pump oil fast enough to keep up with those guys. Well, we figured out what it was. That was the end of it. But anyway, 
quiet, 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 quiet. And then uh, a great cloud of planes went over. They were probably the 101st Airborne on their way. And then we began hearing, seeing flashes, and that probably anti-aircraft and bombing. It was still far, far out. And then you began hearing noise, the distant sound of guns, which is, if you haven't heard it, <laughs> you haven't heard it. It's like thunder, but it's not like thunder. So we gradually approached. And then you began to smell the, the, the powder. It was offshore, and we were still way out. And then the dawn broke, and there was an L destroyer over there that had been sunk by a coastal battery. No, it hit a mine, actually. That It was sitting on the bottom, but it was... So we pulled up and we stayed off the beach there from before dawn until five o'clock in the afternoon when we went in, and that's when all the excitement, and I've talked about that, so we won't repeat it. Afterwards, we were directed to anchor and wait, and you saw LSTs going by with cows and German, French peasants and German prisoners and whatnot on their deck going, going back to Britain. Hmm. But we stayed there waiting, and we got antsy. We thought we'd been forgotten. So Caridio, being a pretty aggressive character, radioed headquarters, ANCON, and what, what the hell are you going to do with us? And as a consequence, we got set to escort a, a group of LCTs, tank landing craft. They're open barges with a ramp that does like that and carry about four tanks, all the way up to the British beaches and then come back. Hmm. We came back. With so on D plus one, we got a two or three mile offshore voyage of inspection from one end of the beach to the other. And that was a break. I never saw so many ships in my life. And uh, some of the battleships were firing and so on and so forth. But we were spectators. And we came back and sat okay. around. Could you see the beach itself? What did that Oh, yeah, like? sure. You could see the beaches. From... Well, what did you see? When you were well, it was a distant shoreline with a little bit of this, that going on. You could okay. occasionally a puff of smoke, but... And empty landing craft coming out and full landing craft going, LCVP, small ones mostly. The Omaha area was very active. No planes, no nothing. It was... Anyway, we got back and we, we sat around for a few more days. And we didn't realize at the time that this was while well, the issue at Omaha was not yet settled. They weren't sure whether they were going to have to take those people off. So they were keeping us there to take them off, oh. which didn't happen, of course. So we went back and then to a place called Poole, which is near, near uh, Portsmouth. And uh, we ran, ran bus trips back and forth, a couple of them. The book will tell you how many are there hauling people over and, and coming back empty. And eventually we got orders to quit that. And it wasn't Poole. Poole was the place we went to. What was the name of that town? Well, I remember it maybe. But anyway, we did go to Poole. And then eventually, while we were at Poole, a couple of our guys took an unauthorized trip into London and back and managed to get back before we sailed. I got, found these things out when I was working with some of my shipmates, enlisted shipmates on that book. Hmm. Got a lot of good stories out of them. Anyway, we went to went to Dartmouth and got hauled up on the Marine Railway and got our bottom scraped and loaded up and went, went to uh, Portsmouth, I guess it was. Portland is the place where we were, not Portsmouth. Portsmouth down at Plymouth. So there was a different sort of ship that was supplying the yeah, features. the landing craft. Well, mostly LCTs. Okay. They didn't use. We didn't carry any people. We were escorting LCTs. We didn't. weren't able to carry cargo. Okay. We couldn't carry vehicles. Well, we could, but they'd have to unload and unload us with a crane, and they couldn't get very many on board. So we weren't used for that. We'd been designed by the British specifically for short runs to the coast of Europe or in the Mediterranean and back, and 
uh, they turned over the blueprints and then we built over a thousand of them. Or at least we authorized over a thousand of them. There were a lot of them. So anyhow, uh, we checked out and they sent us around to Gibraltar, around through the Straits and to uh, Bizerti and Potsawali and so on for the southern French landings. We had another convoy incident there. We were steaming east out of Gibraltar. Again, this happened on the midnight midwatch. All of these disasters tended to happen when there was bad weather or when it was cold, black, dark. We had two, three columns of LSTs, and then outboard on either side a column of LCIs, and then a stern a ship whose name gives away what it was, the USS Nitro ammunition ship, and leading us, the Marblehead, the cruiser that was damaged in, in the Indies and came back with a concrete patch in its bow and all that, an old four-piper cruiser from World War, right after World War I. And that was our escort. Now, the Marblehead was up ahead. So in the middle of the night, we're on MERSIGs, which are light signals. We were back with Lord Nelson for maneuvering ships. <laughs> it, no, we didn't use the voice radio to maneuver ships. We didn't have enough radio in the standard 24-hour watch, and we didn't have any radar either of PPI. So they either hoist a flag or a light, string of lights that had a, a meaning, and then everybody would repeat that until the last guy got it, and then they'd either flip on another light or haul two block the signal. They'd put it all the way up, and then the two block would come back. And then when the, the when the right. when the cr flagship had got response from everybody, when he pulled down the flag, everybody executed the order. Well, this was a mercy signal, which which. was supposed to call for a 10 degree turn to starboard by all ships. Now if you can imagine a, a, a band marching down the field and they all turn at the same time and keep the same formation. So all ships turn together. Or you may remember it from, from, from that rather famous Alec Guinness movie where the admiral's on the bridge and, and one ship turns left and the other one turns right and they collide and it sinks. <laughs> remember that one? Well, we got the ten, all ships turned 10, we turned 10, sent word down to the captain, as you always have to. Messenger came back up, said, message delivered, sir. Well, the captain just apparently just grunted and rolled over. It happened again, all ships turned 10 degrees to the right. Captain grunts. The next one comes up, all ships turned 45 degrees to the right. Wow. But the flagship, which issued that order, for some inexplicable reason, turned left and had a collision with the ship in the lead ship in the column to his to his port to left, and of course that called for another signal. And in the excitement on the bridge, instead of "I'm disabled" or whatever it was, the signal that went out is "I've been torpedoed." <laughs> the flagship said that. Yeah, <laughs> not the not the the the. Oh, the, the LST Commodore, not 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 the escort. No, the escort. The escort was blissfully ignorant of all this stuff. Well, the escort wasn't blissfully ignorant of all this stuff because the escort had gotten a radar contact, and we were responding to that. We were getting that convoy out of the way of a possible submarine. It wasn't a submarine apparently because nothing ever happened. But anyway, the uh, consequences of that were that that convoy broke like a covey of quail. <laughs> a dozen different directions. Well, I dealt with that and sent word down to the captain. The report was that there's been a, a, a convoy commodore reports he's been torpedoed. The convoy is scattered. I have taken station on the Marblehead. And he came storming up, bellowing and snorting and screaming his head off. Why didn't you tell me about these things? Well, he had been told, and he calmed down and realized he had been told. Was, I didn't. He didn't. wasn't pushed to the ear or confined to quarter stage by this one. <laughs> <laughs> so we followed the followed the uh, flagship, the 
Marblehead. And when dawn came, the usual result of that, there was a, a lost ship out there. And then following it were other ships that had found that ship and thought they'd found the convoy. So there were strings of ships all over the place. Except later on we learned that our flotilla flagship had been one of those lost ships. And they had spotted a flashing light. And it was going dot dash, dot dash, dot dash, dot dash, AA, which is your challenge, identify yourself. So they replied with their, and they didn't, they kept getting the dot dash, so they turned towards it, thinking that was the convoy, and steamed off until they finally figured out it was a lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, happened more than once, those kinds of, that's, but anyhow, eventually we got to Bizerti and went in and trained in the Great Lake in Bizerti, the French naval base. A big, round lake with a narrow entrance to it where the French Navy had its major base in the Mediterranean other than Toulon, where the Russian force that went out to Tsushima and got sunk, they stopped there for a while and hmm. so on and so forth. Then we went on up to Salerno, which was where they were holding practice exercises, and eventually they put us in Pozzuoli or Puteoli, which is the place where St. Paul landed when he went to, went to, went to Rome. It's like in a Yellowstone Park, I mean, there are hot springs and fumaroles, and the place smells of sulfur dioxide, H2S, and, and also human excreta. <laughs> and it has a, a Roman marketplace, which is known as the Temple of Jupiter, Jupiter Serapis, which we'd converted to a supply dump, which is sort of famous. There's a column there, which has a stands at tide water, right there, stands at water level, and the t tide in the Mediterranean is, is negligible. And there's a ring of borings around this thing up here, which are put in by intertidal mollusks when the water level was up there. Hmm. When the thing was built, of course, it wasn't built with its base in salt water. So you have proof that it sank, acquired that ring of, of uh, Borings and then rose to where it is now. And that thing was seen by Sir Charles Lyell, one of the fathers of modern geology, and was put in his his first textbook on geology, mm -hmm. which is the first modern textbook on geology, and they've been repeated in geology textbooks everywhere. It's a fine place for a geologist to be. Okay. So anyway, we operated out of that place. It also was a place where an adolescent. Uh, Sophia Lauren was helping her mother in the laundry business. <laughs> we didn't find that out until afterwards. <laughs> it was also a place where you could hitchhike into, into Rome. It's where our ship acquired its first couple of cases of venereal disease. <laughs> but Mother Marsalek managed to intercept most of them before make them do the, the pro before they before they sacked out. So you were training for invasions of which coast? Then, or? Well, we, we, we were in the invasion of the south of France. Okay. We went on up, went through the states of Bonifacio between Corsica and Sardinia, anchored off of Ajaccio and Corsica, and then went in the next morning in uh, Bay, Bay of San Tropez. And uh, we didn't see a single sign of any activity. We weren't that late in the day. We did land, land combat troops from the 45th Division, I believe it was, Oklahoma, Texas Division. 45th and 36th were pulled out of, of Italy and sent into the south of France. The only gunfire we saw was shells from the Nevada going over our head mm -hmm. somewhere inland. One of them fell short. We saw a big, big splash from that. So we landed our people and turned around and pulled out. Went back to Potsawali, where they put us in the business of running a bus service from Potsawali to Leghorn. The front lines in Italy were a little bit north of Leghorn, and they were putting in the, the big African-American Amer division that's so famous. We carried a load of them up there. And the Brazilian Expeditionary Force, we carried mm. two loads of them up there. They were delightful people to have on board. And we carried a load of Italian retreaded Italians that carried them up there and they turned them back and we brought them back. So we did that 
And we also went up to Marseille and picked up a load of, we delivered some, uh, delivered some, some, something up there, picked up a load of escaped prisoners of war. They were people from the Palestine Brigade, which were the beginner of that underground group that raised hell in Palestine under the mandate. They were mean. And also a bunch of Australians who weren't too even-tempered either. And they didn't mix well. They'd been out of discipline. They'd been captured in Tobruk and God knows where. And they'd been living in private homes in Switzerland with no, no discipline. So when the frontier was open, they were taken out. Well, shortly after we got them on board, the, the Israelis grabbed all the good rations and the Aussies went after them with fists and the Israelis pulled knives and our crew was in the middle of all oh, of that. No. So we had trouble with them for a while. But as soon as we got them outside the breakwater, it all subsided. They got sick. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and we also hauled a load of MPs up from Oran. We made it three port part way. And in that convoy, there was a load of of Senegalese prostitutes hauled up by LCI. One of our one of our officers thinks it was us. I know it wasn't us. I was in charge of, the, of the, our passengers, and if we'd had Senegalese prostitutes, I would have remembered it. <laughs> <laughs> they were supplied by the French army for the benefit of their Senegalese troops. A uh, different attitude. So it was easier to move things by sea than on land. Hmm? The land routes? Well, how were you going to, you had to go through, you couldn't get through Italy because the Germans were still in the north right. end of Italy and you couldn't go through Spain because Francisco Franco was not our friend. Okay. Although he was our friend, really. He kept the Spanish out of that war, which otherwise Gibraltar would have been taken. If the Germans, if he'd given the Germans passage through Gibraltar, to Gibraltar, they would have closed the Mediterranean. But that's another story. So we did a lot of that busyness and then along about late November, early December, they took us down to Missouri and gave us, gave us a yard overhaul. We, they put us in the dry dock that serviced the Bay of Tunis' yacht. <laughs> <laughs> I spent the day underneath the ship scraping barnacles off while the captain and the doctor went, went to visit Carthage. I resent that still. <laughs> we were short of officers. Our crew rotated. A lot of people were sent back home. The captain was gone. I had become executive officer. The guy that came on board was a deck officer with a degree in theater, brand new, and he declined to take the job of, of, of engineering officer. So I was being doing both deck and engineering. I was overloaded. Things got out of hand. We burned up an engine because of that, because the oil didn't get changed and I wasn't on top of the logs. But. <laughs> The base people were very nice about it. They came to investigate it, and they tossed it all over. Where so when the when the investigators came, they couldn't find the find, find the evidence. So we were they didn't want a court martial. They wanted to keep us busy. So anyway, that's the way I interpret it. That was a time when I wasn't up to snuff. So then they gave us orders for home, and we trundled on over to Iran, and were there for Christmas, it was cold. And then they sent us out in a convoy that was going home with LSTs and LCIs all, and it was a five knot convoy. Hmm. And it took us 21 days to get from Oran to Charleston, South Carolina. And it was a gale force winds ahead of us all the time. We had the same business most, there weren't as many people sick because they'd gotten used to it, but some of the new people were sick. And they had a guy die on the flagship of meningitis. It was too rough to take the doctor over there, but the doctor was prescribing. We, we figured that out. We saw this ship drop out of line and they all assembled on the fantail and dumped a package overboard. It couldn't be anything but a burial at sea, but that's what it was. So we got to Charleston, went in. They sent half of us on 30-day leave. The other half stayed there while they rebuilt the ship, replaced the engines, did quite a lot of work on it. We came back, they put half new, new half crew on board and sent those guys on 30-day leave. And then we were off on our way to uh, the Pacific. 
And of course, we assumed we were going to go to Japan, and everybody assumed we were going to Japan. What time is it getting to be? Hmm? Oh, we're going to stop. He needs to. Put Good. I've got. In. I've got to get out of here. When do you want me to come back?